Hey everybody, welcome back. In this episode, I'm going to answer a viewer question, a comment that was posted under one of the other videos. And I really appreciate when you participate in the channel and subscribe and thumb up the videos and provide comments and questions down below, as long as they're kind and respectful, of course. And I'm happy to answer those questions if I'm able to do so. So I got a good question in that I thought might be of interest to a number of people, and I thought it would be a good idea to address it as a video. So the question is, if I was to boil it all down and parse it out, how do I drive a surround sound audio system with a stereo amplifier? And let me expand the scope just a little bit, and the question goes, I found a bunch of equipment at a secondhand store and I got a bunch of speakers which turned out to be a 5-1 surround sound speaker set which is a pair of full range front speakers, a pair of full range back speakers, a center channel dialogue speaker which normally goes up by the screen, and a subwoofer. All of these are passive speakers at 4 ohms. In addition to the speakers, this uh, individual picked up a Rust Sound power amplifier in the lot, and it's a stereo amplifier. And he's asking, what's the best way I can uh, hook all of this stuff up together to do something useful? Now, of course, when it comes to hooking up gear and hooking up equipment, there's sometimes more than one way to do things, and sometimes more than one good way to do things. So... I'll give you my opinion as to how I'd approach this and what I might do with it. Now, the surround sound speaker setup, as I mentioned, has six loudspeakers, four full range speakers, plus the center channel and the sub, that makes six. And if you want to have surround sound, you need to be able to drive signal into each one of those speakers independently. Uh, for example, if you have the two speakers in the front of the room and if I play a guitar through both of those speakers with the exact same signal the guitar sound is going to appear acoustically in the soundscape to us as coming from the center. It would be a mono signal if the signal that's driving into the left and the right speaker is perfectly identical and it would provide a mono image of that guitar appearing to emanate from the center of the front of the room. Now of course if the recording engineer decides to just put the guitar signal into the left hand speaker well then that sound is going to move to the left and sound like it's coming from all over there. Or for example if you had a movie and in the movie, you had a street scene with a car going by. You would expect for the sound of that car to come from one speaker and then slowly drop and level on that speaker and come up in the other one. And so that will make the sound appear to go from one speaker and slide over to the other speaker. Then, of course, in order to do that, we need to be able to send separate signals to the different speakers so we can produce a stereo image. Likewise, we need to be able to send separate, individual, unique signals to each of the other speakers, which would be the rear speakers, the subwoofer, that dialogue speaker, in order to produce a complete 360 degree Dolby surround sound soundscape. Now, if we have six speakers, and we need six different signals to drive each of those speakers, that means that we need, hmm, you got it, six different amplifiers to drive those speakers. Each speaker needs its own amplifier so it can have its own individual unique signal to drive it. Now, when I say we need six amplifiers, I don't mean necessarily six amplifier boxes. Uh, for example, right here is uh, heavy, an amplifier. This is a Crown PS200. It is a stereo amplifier. So it's a box. 
and it's got two amplifiers in it. It's got channel one and channel two. And if we look at the back end of it, you'll see that it's got, it's heavy. It's got in, two inputs, two outputs. It's got two amplifiers in one box. And those two amplifiers <clears throat> operate completely and totally independent from each other. It's like two individual amplifiers just wrapped into one metal box. And now certainly they, inside of the box they might share some common components. They probably share a common power supply. But from the outside looking in you have two signal inputs, two signal outputs, and they're two separate amplifiers in one chassis. It's a common configuration with stereo amplifier to have a box with two amps in it. That's normal. You can also get amplifiers that have four channels in the box. Or if you're doing distribution type systems, for example, things like hotels or schools, or other commercial facilities where you got a big facility and you're running speakers in the cafeteria and the lobby and the conference room. All of these are different zones that you might need to drive independently, so each of them needs its own amplifier. And in that case, you might be using an amplifier box that's designed for audio distribution that has eight amplifiers in one chassis. So we need enough amplifiers to drive your six speakers. We need six amplifiers. That box I just showed you contained two. And so we could use a box like that, which would be two amplifiers. And we could use another box that had four amplifiers in it. And between the two of those, that gives us six. We could also use that box with two amplifiers. I could get another one just like it for another two amplifiers. And another one just like it with another two amplifiers and two plus two plus two is six. And so I could drive all six of the speakers in your surround sound system with three stereo amplifiers. Now, in addition to the amplifiers, we need an input signal. I mean, the amplifier is going to amplify the signal and drive the speaker, but we have to put something into that amplifier if we're going to hear anything coming out. And so what's our program source? Well, let's say it's a Hollywood movie. The Hollywood movie is going to have an audio track in it that contains in that audio track data all of the different channels that you need to build the surround sound image. And so this data stream coming out of the movie needs to be broken apart and processed and split into all of the different channels that are going to drive the different speakers in your surround sound system. And so you need to have a device that can interpret that movie and put out the six channels that you need. Now, of course, there are other forms of Dolby Digital that have even more output channels, and they're all more or less backwards compatible and such. But you need a Dolby Digital Decoder in order to decode the movie, to break out the audio track into all of those channels that you can then put into your amplifiers to uh, drive your speakers and have surround sound. So where do we find this? Well, the most obvious answer is a home theater receiver. A good home theater receiver, a typical home theater receiver, is going to give you all of the stuff that you need. It's going to have the audio decoding in it so you can take input from your movie. The receiver will do Dolby Digital Decoding, split it into the five, six or more channels of output that you need. And that box will also contain multiple power amplifier modules for driving the various speakers. So the obvious answer is that to make the best use of this collection, this menagerie of loudspeakers that you've acquired, you need a home AV receiver, one that can do surround sound. Now, the one thing that comes to my mind is that I've seen a lot of home AV receivers that include multiple amplifier modules for driving your front speakers, your back speakers, your center channel speakers, and sometimes other speakers. But very oftentimes, 
They have an output for the subwoofer, which is just a line level signal, but it doesn't have the kind of power needed to actually drive a speaker. You need an amplifier. So you might, in reality, need a home AV receiver for all of these speakers, plus one power amplifier to take the signal that comes out of the receiver for the subwoofer feed and amplify it and drive your passive subwoofer. It's probably more popular to use subwoofers that have their own built-in amplification, a powered subwoofer. And if you had a powered subwoofer, then you could plug it directly into an AV receiver and drive that unit. If you're using a passive subwoofer, that is a subwoofer without any power amplifier built into it at all, then you need an amplifier to drive the speakers. And so you need the receiver, amplifier for the subwoofer, and uh, that's about it. So that would be the ideal solution. That would give you proper surround sound and make use of all of your speakers as they are intended to be used. And that should all work pretty well. Okay, so my recommendation is to obtain a Hi-Fi AV receiver that includes Dolby Digital surround sound processing. That receiver will give you all of the amplifier modules you need, perhaps with the exception of an amplifier to drive your subwoofer, but you've already got that rough sound amplifier, so you're covered there. And the receiver will do all the processing you need, has all the amplifiers you need, and it also most likely will provide the filtering that you need to provide the right ranges of audio frequencies to match the speakers that you have. The main left and right speaker and the rear left and right speaker you have, I'm assuming are small boxes. And small boxes are not going to provide deep, powerful bass. And if you try to make a little tiny shelf, bookshelf type speaker produce deep, powerful bass, well, you're probably going to be disappointed. The speaker's just not going to be able to do it. And the speaker could also be overdriven with too much power and you're just demanding too much of it, and you could possibly break things if you try to make little tiny speakers produce deep, powerful bass. So ideally, we'd like to be able to filter out all of that stuff. So we're not trying to drive the speaker with the kind of material that it just can't do. And so the receiver is probably going to have a setting on it saying, how big are your main speakers? And you would say they're small speakers. And when you make that selection, the receiver filters out all of that super low frequency deep bass stuff and doesn't send it to your main front or rear speakers. And so that way your speakers sound better and they have better power handling and it works better. Likewise, for the subwoofer, the subwoofer is designed to produce that deep rumbling bass, but it's not going to do a very good job of reproducing mid-range or high frequencies. And if you put mid-range and high-frequency material into the subwoofer, that's well, not going to sound very good, and it's going to become localized. So you're going to be able to sit in your room and go, ah, oh, the subwoofer bass is coming from right directly over there, and it won't feel like the bass is really spreading out throughout the room like it's supposed to. So the receiver's most likely going to have some filtering in it where the subwoofer output from that receiver cuts out all of that high frequency stuff and only sends the rumbling deep subwoofer program material to the channel that's driving the subwoofer. So that'll make your system sound a whole lot better. So that's my recommendation is to find a good place to pick up a receiver and a good deal and with an AV receiver and your power amp that you picked up and the speakers you picked up, you should be able to properly set up a surround sound system that works well for you. Okay, so then you may tell me that that is all well and good, but you don't want to buy anything else. It's just, okay, I get all of that, but how do I hook up this whole collection of speakers to the amplifier that I got? Sure. Well, obviously this is going to be a compromise. Probably Kind of a big compromise. But here's my thoughts. That rough sound power amplifier that you have is rated to drive a 4 ohm load. Now it can drive an 8 ohm load or a 16 ohm load. That's real happy. You know, that's uh, less load than, eight ohm, than 4 ohms. But 4 ohms is the minimum. You can't drive less than 4 ohms. If you put loads of lower than 4 ohms on that amplifier, it's going to draw a lot of current out of that amplifier, probably make that amplifier pretty hot 
going to make it work real hard. And uh, it's possible that you could even damage stuff if you try to make it do more work than it's designed to do. And so your speakers that you have are four ohms, meaning that you could take one of those speakers and put it on one of the channels of your power amplifier, and that would be a good match. It would be a perfect match. It would work just fine. And so you could take two of your speakers, two of your you know, main bookshelf speakers, and put one on left channel, one on right channel of your amplifier, and you have a stereo setup that should work just fine. But you're probably not happy with that because that leaves four of your speakers sitting in a box. Now, we know you're not going to do surround sound. You're not. You don't have enough channels. All you got is left and right. That's it. You got a stereo system. But we could tag more speakers off of it if you wanted to just have more speakers. Now, of course, all those speakers are going to be playing exactly the same thing, so it's not going to be a big surround sound image, but you can drive more speakers. So you can drive two channels. You can have a left side of the system and a right side of the system, and we can tie the speakers together if we wanted to. Now, we can't go below 4 ohms, and each one of your speakers already is 4 ohms. If we drive speakers in parallel, as we stack speakers on top of each other in parallel, the impedance goes down. So if you have a 4 ohm speaker and you have another 4 ohm speaker and we put them in parallel with each other, we're going to get 2 ohms. And that's something that your amplifier just shouldn't be driving. And if we put a 4 ohm speaker on top of a 4 ohm speaker on top of another 4 ohm speaker, well, now we're getting really far down in the impedance, and that's something your amplifier shouldn't be driving. And so oftentimes when we connect speakers together, we connect them together in parallel. And so that is we take the plus terminal of one speaker to the plus terminal of the other speaker, and the minus terminal of speaker A to the minus terminal of speaker B, and then we take the plus and minus off of those speakers that are tied together and they go down to the amplifier. And that would be paralleling your speakers where we put all of the pluses together, all the minuses together, and then we take a feed into the amplifier. But as we do that, the impedance goes down, 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 the more speakers we add, and we are already at the lowest impedance we can go with this amplifier with just one speaker attached. So I don't think that paralleling your collection of speakers and tying them onto this amplifier is a real keen idea. But we could put them in series if you wanted to. So instead of connecting the plus of one speaker to the plus of the other speaker and the minus to the minus, we do them in series. So this would be like if you have a flashlight with batteries stacked in it. One sec. We grab my flashlight. So let's say we have a flashlight. This flashlight has batteries within it. A battery cell here and a battery cell there. And as you know, when you put batteries in a flashlight, the, we'll put the plus end up toward the light. So we have minus to plus on the first battery, then minus on the second battery to plus up here. So we have minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, and so forth and so on. And at the ends of this string of batteries, we have a plus and a minus. And then that would go down to our amplifier. So we would just daisy chain these speakers one after another from plus of one speaker to minus of the other, and so forth and so on. And then we take those plus and minus terminals at the end of the chain, and that goes down to the amplifier. And as we connect speakers in series, thusly, then we add the impedances up. So if we have a 4 ohm speaker and another 4 ohm speaker, we tie them together like so in series, that makes 8 ohms. Or if we have a 4 ohm speaker and a 4 ohm speaker and another 4 ohm speaker, that's 4 plus 4 plus 4 equals 12. So now we have a 12 ohm load. And that's fine. That's easy for the amplifier to drive. It's got no problem driving 8 ohms or 12 ohms. It can swing voltage into that much load, no problem at all. Now the downside is that as we, the impedance goes up and up and up, in a typical amplifier we get voltage limited, and so the whole thing works out that generally 
in most cases, as the impedance goes up, the amplifier has an easier and easier time driving that load, no problem at all, but the amplifier can swing its maximum output. But because of the way the whole electrical Ohm's law math works out, you're actually delivering less overall power. But I don't think it's a big issue in this case because the question is, does the system sound good? Does it get loud enough for you? If the answer is yes, who cares how many watts you're exactly putting out as long as it's fulfilling its need? And you could run three speakers off of your left side of that amplifier and three speakers off of your right side of that amplifier. And you could make all those speakers yap at the same time with that Rust Sound power amp. Now, of course, we're going to be putting the same exact identical signal into all three speakers that are connected to your left amplifier output and the three speakers that are on your right amplifier output will also all three of them will get exactly the same signal and so if you have a couple of bookshelf speakers in this chain and then on one side you've also included maybe the subwoofer and then on the second side you have your two bookshelf speakers for your other channel and maybe the center channel speaker in that chain well, you're going to be driving all of those speaker units with the same signal, meaning that your subwoofer box is getting the exact same signal that your bookshelf speakers are getting. And the dialogue speaker will be getting the exact same signal that the other bookshelf speakers will be getting on the other channel of the amplifier. And all of these speakers are not designed to work in the same frequency ranges, and so it may not be the best sounding situation and also since all these speakers are not identical some speakers may play a little louder or quieter given the same amount of input power so you might find that the bookshelf speakers play at a certain volume level but that subwoofer is excessively quiet or excessively loud in comparison and since they're all chained together you got no control over it so you get what you get and that's uh, what you get <laughs> So that's how you could use the Rust Sound Power Amplifier to drive this whole collection of speakers without actually blowing stuff up. But I'd say it's a compromise. I'd say it's probably not going to sound super great. And so if it were me and I wasn't going to get a receiver and I was just going to use what I got, most likely I would probably just set aside that center channel dialogue speaker and the subwoofer and I would just use the bookshelf speakers and I'd tie Two of them in series to make an 8 ohm load i'd tie the other two in series to make another 8 ohm load tie those groups of pairs of speakers onto the amplifier and i'd have a stereo system with two speakers on one side and two speakers on the other side and i'd be a happy guy okay so that's how I would hook this whole collection of stuff up. Now, let's take a little bit deeper look at this specific Rust Sound power amplifier and the controls and features that it has. When I see this amplifier, it, to me, it's a pretty straight ahead, standard, two channel, home hi-fi style power amp. But it does have a couple of slightly unique controls on it that may cause a bit of confusion if you uh, weren't real familiar with things. So let's dig into the controls on this amplifier and what they all do so it uh, is not confusing when you go to hook things up. As we look at the front panel of the Rust Sound P75 power amplifier, there's just a few controls and switches. Uh, the first switch is the power switch, which turns the unit on. Then you'll see that there are two more push buttons for speakers A and B that send signal to the speaker connectors in the back of the unit. Now, it says that it can drive speaker set A and speaker set B, but do keep in mind that those are really not separate outputs. There's just one amplifier module driving left channel, and then that can drive speakers A or B or both attached to left channel, but it's just simply a switch. It's not an extra amplifier output. So it's basically just a way that we can tie wires together. There's really only two outputs on this unit, which is right and left channels. Speakers A and B are just additional convenience connection points. 
and it gives us some convenient switching if we want to just drive one speaker or another or both but there's really only one amplifier driving a particular channel which is left or right you don't have four discrete outputs so we got the power switch we got switches for enabling speaker set a and speaker set b and then as we slide over towards the right side of the control panel we have a balance control which allows you to send the signal only to the left side or to the right side or provide signal to both left and right sides typical balance control and a volume control which uh, i think is pretty self-explanatory so now let's flip the unit around take a look at the backside connectors where things get just slightly more interesting Looking at the back side of this unit, starting on the left hand side, you'll see that the first group of connectors is a group of RCA pin connectors, which are the low level signals that go in and out of this unit. This unit is a little bit unusual in that it's got automatic input switching. So it can be connected to two input signals and sw automatically switch between them. There's no switch in the front panel as to do you want to listen to input number one or input number two? It does all that automatically. I think that's kind of an interesting feature. Personally, I don't think I'd use it. What I would do is I would put my input signals into the middle jacks in that group of connectors, which is the primary input, and be happy and be done and ignore all those other connectors. Now, the other connectors on the far left are the secondary input source and so if the amplifier detects that there is a signal present on those secondary inputs it will automatically switch from the primary to the secondary that's the idea and then on the far right of that group of input connectors those are actually outputs that is just a an exact duplicate of the input signal that you've driven into the center connectors so you can drive your signal into those center two connectors in that connector block and then if you needed to or wanted to you could take a connection off of the far right pin connector and daisy chain that signal off into some other piece of equipment for some other processing we're not going to do that so Bottom line is, I think in your situation, you're going to just use the center two connectors in that input signal block. Now, moving over to the right just a little bit, you'll see that there are two switches. The first switch is called Auto On. Now, maybe I could rename that switch to be Enable Sleep Mode. Uh, let me tell you a little story. I've got a friend with a brand new Ford pickup truck. And as I'm riding along with her, as she's driving the truck, we come up to a stoplight and she comes to a stop. And as she stops the vehicle, we wait there for a moment and the engine dies. And I turn to her and I go, everything okay? And she's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's fine. That's just how it works. Uh, as soon as I press the accelerator to take off again, the engine starts right back up and we continue on it. It does this to save energy. Well, that's what this amplifier is capable of doing. If you put this into auto on mode and you have the power switch in the front enabled, the unit will automatically turn itself on and operate as soon as it senses that there is an input signal. And when the input signal goes away for a little while, the unit puts itself to sleep just conserve power and so that's what it's doing so that might be a handy feature if you you're using this unit for example to be a subwoofer amplifier you can connect it to the subwoofer output of your receiver and connect the output of the rest sound power amplifier to drive your sub and just enable auto on mode of course push the front panel on switch and that way, as soon as your receiver turns on and starts sending subwoofer information out into this rust sound unit, it will turn on and drive the sub. And then when you turn off your receiver and stop playing music, oh, a little bit later, the rust sound amplifier will just automatically go to sleep and conserve power. So that's just power conservation mode switch. Uh, if you turn auto on to the off position, 
then the unit won't automatically turn itself on or go to sleep mode when it's idle. The other switch that we have in this group is labeled bridge mode. I do not advise using bridge mode. I generally don't like using bridge mode anywhere, but there are places where it is appropriate, sure. Bridge mode will allow you to connect the right side of the amplifier to the left side of the amplifier and join them together as one single channel, mono, one channel amplifier with more power than either the left or the right channel. So if you want to get a little bit more power and you only need one output, you can go to bridge mode, get a little more power. And you will sacrifice almost every other performance metric of the amplifier in doing so. You'll get greater distortion, greater noise, lower transient response, lower damping factor, and a poor ability to drive loads. But you'll get a little bit more power. So if a little bit more power is worth that sacrifice to you, and you only need one channel, well, then you can go to bridge mode. And when you go to bridge mode, you only supply one input signal. And you take your output signal that drives the speakers off of the plus terminal of the right channel and the plus terminal of the left channel. And that's bridge mode. I don't advise using it. Let's leave that off. And then as we move to the far right side of the rear panel, you'll see the speaker output connectors. And these are five-way binding posts. My advice with five-way binding posts is to use double banana jack type connectors and your speaker wires so you can just plug them directly in and that's very convenient and nice. You can also unscrew those binding post terminals a little bit and insert wires. If you do that, be careful not to have any little frayed pieces of wire that could possibly short out between the connector terminals. You'll see that there are outputs for your left channel and your right channel, both plus and minus, and those plus and minus connectors should correlate with the plus and minus terminals of your loudspeaker. Polarity is important for proper operation. And you'll see that there is a bank of outputs for speaker set A and a bank of outputs for speaker set B, and those are controlled by the switches on the front panel. But do not be fooled that there is any difference between the connectors on set A and B. For example, on left channel connectors, speaker set A and speaker set B, if they're both enabled on the switches in the front of the panel, are just simply electrically tied together and then they go to the one amplifier module that is driving all of those connectors for the left channel. And likewise, in the right channel, there is only one amplifier that is driving both speaker sets A and B. So speakers A and B are not separate outputs. They're just tied together through a switch. And so if you put a 4-ohm load on speakers A and then another 4-ohm load on speakers B, and you try to run both of those at the same time, well, your amplifier module is going to be looking at that whole collection between speakers A and B tied together as a two-ohm load, and bad things happen. So don't be fooled that those are really any kind of independent outputs. They're not. They're just, tie they're just switch contacts, and they're just convenience features for connectors. So those are your loudspeaker outputs, and... Other than that, it's a pretty straightforward stereo amplifier with about 75 watts a side. So I hope that helps answer some of the questions you have about the equipment that you've collected and some of the options you might have if you wanted to drive a bunch of speakers with one amplifier without uh, breaking stuff. Hey, thanks for sticking with me through this video. I really appreciate your support. And I appreciate if you choose to become a subscriber. And if you do, please ring that bell so that you're notified when new content comes down so you don't miss anything good. Uh, if you'd like to throw a comment down below with any questions, observations you have, as long as it's, you know, kind and respectful and polite, I would appreciate that. So uh, if you throw comments down below, I'll do my best to respond to them if I can. And once again, thanks for watching the videos, and I hope to catch you again soon on another one. Take care.